I welcome you to follow along either in your Bibles or behind me on the screens as I read from Malachi 3, 1 to 4, and then Luke 3, 1 to 6. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Luke 3, 1 to 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went to, into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. The word of God for the people of God. It is the Advent season. It's a time of preparation. And you can see, week after week, we're bringing more elements to our major scene. It's a way of preparing our hearts for Jesus coming. So I was thinking about preparation this week. I thought about my grandfather, Arthur Hess. Art was a farmer. He was a meticulous farmer. When he was in the midst of his farming, you could have gone and you could have walked down every fence row on the farm and you would not have found one fence post that was rotting, not one piece of fence falling to the ground. You would look at his barns and you wouldn't see any broken pieces of wood. You probably didn't even see any fading paint. Art took care of his stuff. He kept his, fa his tractors complete, just perfectly well-oiled and running just beautifully at all times because when he needed it, he wanted it to work. Art's great passion, his most beloved joy, the masterpiece of his existence was corn. He talked about corn all the time. Every summer, did you see how much the corn grew in the last week? No, Grandpa, we didn't notice such things. Glad you did. Hey, you're headed up to the barn, are you? Can you look at the at the the you know the water catcher and to tell me? Uh, can you tell me what the how much rain we got last night? I need to know because I'm thinking about the corn, always thinking about the corn. Now, some would have said that when Art Hess was farming, he grew the best corn in Lancaster County. I would say that was because of his preparation. 
every year, planting just the right time, just the right amount of fertilizer, plowing at the perfect opportunity when the ground was just the right moisture content, not too dry, not too wet. And then he would get on that tractor and he'd fill his tractor up with the seeds and he would make sure that his lines were perfectly straight, that every seed was planted with just enough space in between for the perfect amount of growth, the best corn that anyone could ever imagine. Meticulous preparing. Our scripture from Malachi is about preparation. So remember from last week, Malachi is a prophet just as Jeremiah was. Malachi was living in a time where the people of Israel were living in exile. They were separated from God. They felt like God was missing and they were longing for more, more God, more in their lives. They were longing for the temple again. They were longing for a king to mediate for them. They were seeking more. And Malachi gives them this message from God. There will be a messenger that's going to come and he will prepare the way. Suddenly the Lord will come to the temple again. The messenger of the Lord is coming. And the Lord will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. And then we move into Luke 3 and we hear this words about John the Baptist who was believed to be that messenger of which Malachi spoke. John, the son of Zechariah, was living in the wilderness. John, like many prophets, was a little bit quirky. Some places it says that John was living on locusts and honey, that he wore strange clothing, and he was out in the wilderness all by himself preaching to the woods. But it didn't take long till people heard about the things that they were saying, that he was saying, and came to find out what it was all about because they were longing and waiting for God. Could this be the messenger, or is this maybe God's presence come to be with us? John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was out proclaiming and preparing the way for God by inviting us to repent. Wait a minute. Really? God's coming, and your message to us is to repent? to confess, to turn back to God, to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That's not fun. If God's coming, the temple is going to be rejuvenated. Let's celebrate. Let's get out the helium and the balloons. Let's get out the champagne. Let's have a party. But no, the prophet says, repent for the forgiveness of sins. We don't like talking about sin, do we? Sin's yucky. Makes us look at the stuff that we don't like about ourselves. We don't want to talk about this stuff. But somehow, we have to recognize as followers of Jesus, as people who read the scriptures through the lens of Jesus as our core values say that we do, we have to recognize that something is going on with this sense of repentance and forgiveness of sins. In Matthew 1.21, the writer says that Mary will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus says, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, not the right, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We may not like it, but sin was important to Jesus. It's why he came. I was reading a book by one of my favorite authors last week. Her name is Brene Brown. Brene is a researcher. She studies, of all things, shame. And she talks and she writes books about shame, how to overcome shame. She was called to speak at a conference, and this was the first time she was ever called to speak at a business conference. So she knew she was going to be there with a bunch of business people trying to learn practices to be better business people to make more money. 
And she got there, and she was met by the woman that was kind of running the things. And she said, you know, Brene, what do you need for microphones? Or what do you need to put on the screen? You know, what do you need? How can we help you? And she kind of went through those details. And then she said, oh, you know, Ms. Brown, Dr. Brown, she said, um, what are you going to be talking about? And Brene said, well, I'm, I research shame. The woman stepped back, giving a little space. She said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That isn't going to work. That's not going to work here. We want you to talk about joy. We want you to talk about pursuing the goodness of life and, and, and living and living life to the fullest and being the best business people we can be. Well, no, immediately, Brene was overcome with shame because she felt like what she was bringing to the table wasn't good enough. As the weeks went by, she thought about it, and she said, you know, Hunter, what... Hunter, she was talking to me? Okay, so <laughs> I'm reading the book. Where's my manuscript? Um, it's reading the book. She goes, weeks go on, and she's thinking, and she's contemplating, and she says, Brene, I'm not sure that we can experience joy to the fullest. I'm not sure that we can experience life to the fullest if we don't deal with this stuff that is getting in the way. We as human beings, we love to focus on the good stuff. We want to focus on, you know, the things that make us happy. But if we don't, if we don't deal with some of the stuff that holds us back from that happiness, we will never experience it to the fullest. Imagine someone goes to the oncologist and meets with their doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, you've got cancer. Oh, we're going to cut it out. You're going to go th through chemotherapy, and, and your life is, is going to be great. You're going to be fine. And the person stands up and says, no, 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 no. We don't, let's not talk about this cancer. What is cancer? We don't, you know, is cancer even real? I mean, I'm, really, I'm a healthy guy. I got strong legs. I've got a good heart. You know, I eat well. I, I think I'm going to be fine. Let's just, let's not even worry about that. What is their future going to hold? If we don't deal with the stuff that is holding us back from life. One of the greatest ways that art prepared from one year to the next was by dealing with the weeds that popped up in his corn the year before. So many, many years ago, it was, it was a time that, that I, I would call, I like to call, the great Shattercane epidemic. Shattercane was this weed that grew up, it kind of looked a lot like corn, but it was very thin and it would grow and it was very tall and it had this tassel that was these seeds and they would dry out, and at the end of the year, when the corn was being brought in, the, 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 the shatter cane would fall, and it would literally shatter, and the seeds would just go all over the place. And if you didn't deal with the shatter cane, you were going to have weeds just completely overcoming your corn. That was the worst thing that could happen to Art's fields. So he had to find a way to deal with the shatter cane. Well, when the stuff first came out, there was no herbicide to kill it. So he hired his grandsons. Week after week in the summer, and that may have only been one week, I don't know, but you know how things grow the older we get, the longer we separate from them. Week after week, my cousin Andy and my grandfather would walk through the cornfields, walking through the cornfields, looking on both sides, trying to find the shatter cane, and we would see it, and we'd dig it up with the hoe, and we'd put it in the can, and every once in a while, my grandfather would stop, and we'd look over him at him, and he'd point at some that we missed in our rows that he saw anyway. And all summer long, it felt like we would collect shatter cane. And then after the corn grew and it was tall, we would go through again, completely covered from head to toe with clothing so that we wouldn't get scratched up by all of the, the leaves from the corn stalks. And we'd go through, and if we found any shatter cane, we'd cut the top off, and we'd throw that in our bucket, and we'd take it, and Grandpa would throw it on the pile and burn it up. That was the best way that he knew to prepare his fields for the next year so that the shatter cane wouldn't overcome the corn. Because the shatter cane would steal all the nutrients and steal all the water, grow up and start taking sunlight, and the corn would not grow to the greatest possible potential that it could because of the weeds. There's stuff in our lives holding us back from experiencing God to the fullest. And it's sin. You know, we don't like talking about it. We don't want to confront it. We don't want to think about it, but we have to if we want to experience life to the fullest. And what is sin? Some people would say that sin is missing the mark of God's perfection. As a matter of fact, I think Peter said that. 
Some would say that sin is lawlessness. Others have said that sin is that which hurts us. Some have said that sin is that which does not work. But sometimes it's kind of hard to put a finger on it what sin is, what it looks like. There's certain places in the Bible that give us some details. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the flesh. Um, Somewhere along the way, a group of desert fathers developed the uh, seven deadly sins. Um, Envy, wrath, sloth, lust, gluttony, greed, pride. All of these things are things that separate us from God, that pull us away from God's purposes and God's plan for us hold us back from experiencing God to the most full. There's a couple things that I think we have, to, we have to recognize, a couple assumptions that we have to make, or things that we have to understand. We are all sinners. Sin does not make us bad people. Sin makes us human. But sin hurts us. And sin holds us back from the glory that God wants for each and every one of us. You know, as I said, we're all sinners. Sometimes, in the past, at times, I've heard different Christian people talking about, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I live pretty well. You know, I don't, I don't think that, I don't really think that I sin that much anymore. You know, Jesus is in my life, and, 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 I, and I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't really sin. <laughs> that's, to me, that's, that's pride. That's one of the uh, seven deadly sins. And I often want to say to those people, take a look at your life, open your eyes. I think the world that we live in, we have to recognize that there is a possibility that each and every one of us is wrestling with greed in some way, shape, or form. We live in the United States, in a place where some of us have two or three cars, uh, in families with two people or one person, and in throughout the world, one in eight people has a car. We have so much in some way, each and every one of us wrestles with greed. And we don't like to think about gluttony, but gluttony is one of the sins that comes up the most in the Bible. I don't like to think about gluttony. I love to eat. And, I mean, well, so who possibly maybe ate too much last Thursday? Two Thursdays ago? Not last Thursday. Two Thursdays ago. Thanksgiving. Did anybody maybe possibly eat too much? The rumor has it that there's someone in our congregation that spent some time at Ikea and the Cheesecake Factory uh, this week and confessed on Facebook that that may have been gluttony. Rick Schaefer, we're glad to have you here. Would you like to come forward and confess those sins for us? (laughs) We can laugh about it and we make jokes, but yet, yet... You know, I don't think that anybody's going to be held back from heaven uh, because they ate too much on Thanksgiving or went to Ikea or the Cheesecake Factory or the both at the same time. Uh, we don't go or miss out on heaven because of our sinfulness, because of God's grace and following Jesus. We're set free. But we have to realize and recognize that all of these little things, even the things that we laugh about, are things that hurt us. Let's think about gluttony just for a moment. When we eat more than what we need, we are holding back from someone else. And there is a lot of hunger in this world and a lot of hungry people that Jesus cares deeply about. But even more so, when we take more than what we need or when we're eating in a gluttonous fashion, usually it's happening because something's going on in our lives. I don't know about you, but for me, I eat when I'm sad. I eat when I'm happy. When I'm frustrated, I, I, mean, I could, <laughs> I could, you can just, you can pay attention. You probably tell my mood by how many times I'm running back and forth the kitchen uh, to see what might be in the kitchen on any given day of the week. Those are places where we should be turning to God. When we're happy, we should be worshiping and praising God. When we're sad, we should be looking to God for our comfort, but we look to these other things that pull us away from God's purposes, and we recognize the way that gluttony hurts us. Our world is completely overwhelmed by the problem of obesity. Sin hurts us. We're called to prepare our hearts, 
to prepare a place in here. If we're going to do that, we need to take sin seriously. Now, I got another sort of important point to make, I think. Sometimes we as Christians tend to take sin too seriously. Sometimes we forget that Jesus died so that we would be forgiven. We sin, then we experience shame. What happens when we have shame? We feel like we are not good enough. We are not worthy. We have to receive God's grace. You see, we are human beings, and we, we like black and white. We like to think to ourselves, well, it's either God's grace has completely forgiven us and sin doesn't matter, or uh, sin is the most horrible thing in the world, which it probably is, and we have to deal with it all the time. It's our main focus, and it's all we think about. We've got these two things, but it's not black or white. It's not one or the other. It's both. We are absolutely positively forgiven for everything that we will ever do, for every mistake that we will ever make, for every Thanksgiving meal, for every time that we live out of greed, for every time that we are selfish, for every time that we hurt someone else or hurt ourselves. We are already forgiven. But yet, that sin still hurts us. It still does something that darkens our hearts and keeps us away from God. So simultaneously, at the same time, we need to live in God's grace, and we need to be reflective upon our brokenness. I would encourage us, as part of preparation for this Advent series, for this Advent time, to think about some kind of reflective practice to contemplate your life to think about why you do the things you do, how we feel about the things that we're doing, our emotions. Let's kind of reflect on this stuff. And Paul often says in the Bible, St. Paul talks, and he says we need to wake up. An opportunity to wake up, to prepare our hearts. Uh, one way that we might do that is an ancient practice called uh, the examine of the heart. It's got lots of different names, but basically it's just an opportunity at the end of the day, at the end of each day in this Advent, we might sit down. And I'm going to go through this really quickly. I actually think maybe we'll send it out in the Wednesday night, uh, the Wednesday email. If you are interested in participating in this practice, uh, you don't have to write it down right now. We begin by giving thanks to God for all the blessings that Jesus has given to us. We then declare our dependency upon God. Jesus, I can't do this without you. I can't turn away from my sin, my sin and my shame without you. Then we spend some time looking at throughout the day, where have I seen God moving? Where have I seen God today? I've seen God in children singing. I've seen God in the beautiful, amazing voice of Madeline Bender. I see God in all of you here when you could be at home sleeping. Where do we see God moving today? Then we get into the hard stuff. Where have I struggled? Where have I experienced anxiety? Where have I experienced depression? Where have I done things that made me tilt my head? And then we finally pray, Lord God, lead me. Take this from me. Because only through your Holy Spirit and your power can I walk away, turn away from the brokenness of my heart that separates from me from you. Lord Jesus, walk with me. Make me stronger, renew me, and change me. Finally, I just leave us with this last thought. Once we start to reflect, once we start to dig into the brokenness in our lives, hand that over to Christ, then we become a people that can share and invite others into a deeper faith with Jesus. In Luke 22, Jesus says this to Peter. He's calling him Simon at the time. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. We're all sinners. But I have prayed for you, Jesus says, that your faith may not fail, and Jesus prays for us. And when you have turned back, then you are called to strengthen others. Jesus is with us. Help us to prepare our hearts to walk more closely with him this Advent series. In the name of Christ.